The Trusted Platform module is a hardware chip that's designed to bring a new level of security to computers. In situations like electronic commerce and e-banking, current data security is inadequate because malicious attackers could undetectably modify the state of your computer and its software so that passwords and other sensitive information could be compromised. One of the goals of the TPM chip is to allow your computer to attest to a remote server confirming that the software has not been modified and that the configuration is correct. The, the inspiration was actually the internet itself. Uh, with the onset of the, of the internet at, at the, uh, the end of the last century, uh, we, we recognised that we really needed a, a way to protect computer systems that are becoming communicating devices. We're increasingly dependent on this online world, and it's an online world where we're sharing resources. We share the processing power in the big data center. We share the storage with other people. We share the networking infrastructure over which this runs. One of the key pieces of technology in making that shared infrastructure safe is trusted computing. The functionality of the TPM has been specified by an industry consortium known as the Trusted Computing Group. In a series of three documents, totaling nearly 800 pages, it defines approximately 110 functions that software can call to achieve a variety of security functionality. For example, this function called TPM seal is used in order to encrypt data with a key that is held by the TPM. The calling software supplies the data to be encrypted and specifies the TPM key to be used. In return, the calling software receives a data blob, which is the encryption of the original data. Later, some other software can request decryption by supplying the blob and again specifying the key. One of the pervading concepts used throughout the TPM specification is called auth data, standing for authentication or authorization data. Auth data is like a password that authorizes usage of the TPM functionality. For example, in the case of sealing or encrypting data, both the seal and the unseal command make use of a TPM key which may be protected by auth data. The calling software has to prove that it knows the value of the auth data, just like you have to demonstrate knowledge of your password in order to use your email account. When your browser proves knowledge of your password to a webmail server like Gmail, the password is encrypted with a session key that has been established using the web server's public key. That mechanism was considered too heavyweight for the TPM. Because the TPM is a small and low power device, the TCG designers did not want to require the TPM to perform public key decryption every time a command is called, so they used a lighter weight and computationally cheaper mechanism known as HMAC. An HMAC can be used to prove knowledge of a value K to someone else who knows K. In such a way that a third party observing the messages between the prover and the verifier cannot derive K. Unfortunately, this design makes the TPM auth data vulnerable to guessing attacks. If the auth data is based on a human memorable string, then an attacker could have a reasonable chance of finding it if he is able to verify hundreds of millions of guesses. The pin on your bank card is an example of a weak secret. There are only 10,000 possible values, so it could be that an attacker could just try each one until he gets it right. And for that reason, the machine would confiscate the card after the second or third attempt. The TPM resists online guessing attacks, where the attacker asks the TPM to confirm each guess. After a few incorrect guesses, the TPM won't answer anymore. But the TPM designers inadvertently allowed the possibility of an offline attack in which the attacker can check his guess without querying the TPM. That is a design error. The, the attack that you've, uh, you've devised or you've, you've discovered it is one that occurs in, in, a, in a peculiar corner case. The case is one where you've got an external caller who's calling over um, uh, an SSL session, perhaps, into a machine that's been compromised. That's right. That's really the, the only uh, new attack that is enabled by, uh, by this discovery. The, w the way to prevent the attack, the way to remediate the attack, is simply to choose a password with a large number of randomly chosen characters inside it. Um, 
the, the, the technical speak is a high entropy password. You just need a high entropy, high entropy password, and that prevents people from mounting this kind of attack. It is quite a normal, actually, for any complex technology, and the engineering like uh, TPM, and uh, uh, have uh, problems or issues in the design is not very unusual. And the important thing is we should find it and uh, we should introduce some suitable um, new solutions and then make sure it's changing the, in the next version of TPM. The way we propose to fix the TPM specification is to use a protocol that allows parties that share a weak, low entropy secret to securely compute a strong, high entropy secret and use that in the HMAC. Yeah, the algorithm we use to build this solution is called the Steeper. This is a password-based authenticated key agreement algorithm, and it was uh, an invented by the David Jambrum in 1996. The algorithm is quite simple. It's based on the ordinary Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and the only difference from Diffie normal Diffie-Hellman key exchanging is how to compute the uh, Diffie-Hellman base. So now suppose the attack is fixed. What now? Yeah, okay, well I think you always are trying to deal with something new. Like you said, the attackers don't sit still. The, the, you, don't, you don't create something and the attackers go, oh, well, they've fixed that hole, so I'm done, I'm going to go away. It, it's instantaneous. As soon as you close one hole, they start looking some, someplace else. They poke, they prod, they look for things, look for problems. So you're always responding. As a defender, <clears throat> you always have the, the defense problem. They can have attacks, a thousand attacks can fail, but one successful one beats the defense. So defense has to be 100%, attacks can fail all the time. Suppose now we've got trusted computing chips that are secure. What are good applications for them? Some people have expressed worries that trusted computing is set to benefit corporations and disempower individuals. But it doesn't have to be like that. Trusted computing can be a privacy-enhancing technology. For example, right now, if I want to open a Google account, I have to give Google all kinds of information about me. I have no guarantees about how they will use that information. Can trusted computing help in that situation? So 10 years from now, you can imagine a world in which we've sorted out some of these trusted computing issues, and we have client devices that we can absolutely rely upon in our lives personal devices that we might authenticate ourselves to, but which will handle all of the identity management issues in authenticating me to every one of the services that I would use out there. And the individual needs to make some very high level policy decisions about where in their lives do they want to reveal who they are and where in their lives do they want to remain anonymous. And that's the level of security decision an individual should make. Where do they want to remain private about what they do, and where are they happy to be open about what they want to do. TPMs could also be used on servers so that people can get security and privacy guarantees when they trust servers with their data. Well, you could imagine a social networking site that actually operated above trusted computing as a way of just locking down photo sharing student out there posting photos of themselves in some drunken you know, party might like to get those photos back at some future point when they decided that they're now running through the US Senate or something. And we can imagine a world where we can just about understand how information could be put out there, but in a way that it is actually recoverable, that we can take things back. So kind of take all of the benefits that people, you know, that some of the big companies thought they could get with digital rights management and actually made them accessible to individuals. As with any technology, we have to make sure that its impact on society is a net benefit. Two things are necessary to enable that. One is that TPM functionality needs to be rigorously analysed and verified. That's the job of people like me. Another necessary thing is to build good applications that will benefit the world. Maybe that's the job of people like you.